Ophthalmoscopy is the examination through the pupil of the internal surface of the back of the eye and it was introduced over 150 years ago. It remains an important skill because it will help you to diagnose not only intrinsic eye pathology but also systemic diseases through their ocular manifestations. The principal aim of this video is to teach you how to perform ophthalmoscopy using the direct ophthalmoscope. We're going to divide up this task into three stages. To start with, we'll show you how the instrument works and explain its controls. Next, we'll take you through how to set it up and align it so that you get a good view of the red reflex. And finally, we'll show you how to systematically examine the back of the eye or ocular fundus. Although the direct ophthalmoscope was invented by Helmholtz in 1850, aside from some optical refinements, the same principles of operation apply to the current range of instruments. There's a mirror that reflects the light source into the eye, a central viewing hole through which the eye is examined, together with an adjustable lens wheel for clearly focusing the image. There are three basic controls that are common to all modern ophthalmoscopes, regardless of their design. Firstly, there's an on-off switch. This also controls the brightness of the light and is usually found on the top of the handle. Secondly, a lens wheel which adjusts the focus. This is mounted in the head of the instrument and carries a graduated range of lens powers around its edge. Dialing this wheel clockwise increases the lens power. This moves the focal point nearer the observer. Conversely, anti-clockwise rotation effectively decreases the power of the intervening lens, which moves the focal point further away from the observer. The third control is for the light aperture. It's usually found on the front of the instrument as a dial or small lever. It allows you a choice of different shapes and sizes of apertures. This choice usually includes slits as well as green or blue filters. So you should now have a clear idea of how the instrument works and how to use the three controls. Let's move on to see how to use the ophthalmoscope for examining the red reflex and then the ocular fundus. Think of this in a sequence of three steps. Preparation of the ophthalmoscope, followed by preparation of the patient, and finally examination of the eye. To prepare the ophthalmoscope, turn it on and check that it's working. Then select a large round aperture for illumination, and finally rotate the focusing wheel so that it's set to zero. The instrument's now ready to use. Next, preparing the patient. Get them sitting comfortably before you begin. Ideally, you should dilate both pupils to get a clear view. 1% tropicamide given a quarter of an hour beforehand is safe and usually adequate for this. If the patient wears glasses, then generally they're better removed because they often produce reflections and artefacts and they can be physically awkward during the examination. However, if they're particularly high powered, then it can be helpful to leave them on because the ophthalmoscope lenses alone may not be powerful enough to neutralize a high refractive error. With the ophthalmoscope and patient now prepared, you're set to proceed with ophthalmoscopy. To keep their eyes steady, you'll need to give them an object straight ahead that they can gaze at with one eye while you're examining the other. Use your right eye and right hand to examine the patient's right eye, and vice versa for the left eye. You can gently place your other hand on their brow. This helps you to steady yourself and also enables you to lift their upper lid when you need to. Now shine the light into the pupil and observe the red reflex. The red reflex that you see is the same phenomenon as the red eye seen in flash photos. It's simply the reflection of the ophthalmoscope light back off the choroidal vessels. In practice, it's very useful for assessing the clarity of the ocular media. Any opacities, such as a corneal scar, a cataract, or a vitreous hemorrhage, are backlit by the red reflex and silhouetted in the pupil. If the opacity is particularly dense, then the red reflex will be abolished altogether. Having looked at the red reflex, you're now ready to examine the fundus. To do this, align yourself about 15 degrees temporal to the visual axis and you'll be approximately in line with the optic disc. In this position, keep the red reflex in view and slowly move towards the patient. Rack the lens wheel clockwise as you do so to stay in focus as you get nearer. Your primary aim is to identify the optic disc and keep it in focus using the lens wheel. Having found the disc, what do you do next? Well, you use it as your reference point, a sort of base camp for exploration of the rest of the fundus. 
Look in turn at its margin, its colour and its central cup. A healthy optic nerve head is an orange-pink colour with a clear disc margin and has a central cup from which the vessels emerge. Having examined the disc, go on now to look at the major blood vessels as they radiate out from it and form the four vascular arcades that supply the quadrants of the fundus. You can readily bring each area into view by asking the patient to look towards the quadrant that you want to examine. For example, look up to the right brings the upper right quadrant into view. In order to examine both the lower quadrants, the lid has to be lifted up as the patient looks down. As the final part of fundoscopy, you should examine the central retina lying inside the vascular arcades. It contains the macular region and the centrally located fovea. To bring the fovea into view, simply ask the patient to look directly at your light. Some patients will find this difficult to tolerate, which is why it's best left until last. You've now completed your examination. Having outlined the benefits of this technique, you should also be aware of its two principal limitations. The first is that the high magnification and small field of view mean that you have to build a collage of the whole fundus in your visual memory and then mentally stitch it together. This only really becomes reliable with regular practice. Secondly, the direct ophthalmoscope is a monocular instrument and can therefore only ever give you a flat, two-dimensional image. This imposes limits on your accurate judgment of height and depth, which require stereoscopic vision. So that just about completes the basic tutorial on the use of the direct ophthalmoscope, but before we wrap it up, we'll show you some pathology for your interest. Here's a pale atrophic disc that you often see in multiple sclerosis or following optic nerve trauma. This disc is swollen with a blurred margin. One important cause of this is raised intracranial pressure. Here's a disc that has an enlarged cup that's characteristic of advanced chronic glaucoma. Or you may see the growth of new disc vessels in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Aggregation of pigment granules in the peripheral retina is typical of retinitis pigmentosa. The central retina is the area affected by age-related macular degeneration, which is of increasing prevalence in our aging population. Finally, you should realize that as with any clinical skill, proficiency comes at a cost. You need to practice ophthalmoscopy regularly to develop and maintain the skill. So try and get into the habit of using it routinely as part of your normal examination. The sooner you start, the quicker you'll get up to speed.